editor at The Pudding, which is a very small online publication. Uh, we explore topics in culture with visual essays. So yeah, basically we're kind of in between data journalism and just kind of like interactive data viz. Um, we're somewhere in between those two things. We don't consider ourselves like uh, a news outlet or anything like that. Um, we don't follow the news cycle. We just kind of explore topics that are data, data driven that are more kind of culture based. Um, and we'll get into that a lot more in detail. Um, so the pudding, this is our new website, which we are rolling out next week. So it's unfamiliar to anyone that's visited our current website. Um, but as I said, we're uh, an editorial publication. We create visual essays. Um, I can give you a couple examples. So this was actually the first one I did which was exploring um, the MBA and what would happen if we could jump in a time machine and do the draft over, which is where they select the players each year um, based on how they actually ended up turning out. Um, so if we got to do over. So it's a visual essay. And so for me, that usually means anything from data viz to integrating uh, all sorts of multimedia um, and just try to tell the story in the most engaging visual way possible. Um, in this case, there's some scrolly telling, and then there's a bunch of charts. Uh, so this is kind of the nut graph chart here. Can I explain scrolly telling? Can I explain scrolly telling? Yeah, it's just when you, you scroll. scrolly telling. <laughs> he was done. So scrolly telling is just when you scroll, and what you normally do on a web page, and that triggers the graphic or the chart that you're looking at to change. Um, so it's really it's just a technique in. So when you scroll back up, does it like reverse? Or do you if done back? right, yeah. yeah. But it's not always done properly. Yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, so yeah, I, we, we do a lot of scrolly telling uh, at the pudding. It's, we're fans of it because it, in a lot of charts like this one, for example, um, if you have buttons or things where people have to click to, for the graphic to change, um, you're just going to inherently lose a lot of people. So when you scrolly tell, they're just performing their natural behavior, right? Scrolling, and then you update the chart. So you're forcing them to see what's important. So it's bubbling up that important content. Um, so this is one such example which relies very heavily on scrolling telling uh, and just kind of breaks down, breaks down the whole um, MBA redraft in a whole bunch of charts. Uh, this one was arguably one of the ones that kicked off uh, the pudding slash polygraph uh, a couple years ago, which was just revamped a couple days ago. Uh, which is looking at the largest vocab in hip hop. So it's what it sounds like. It's analyzing uh, rappers' vocabularies um, and comparing them. Uh, so this was done by my coworker Matt Daniels. So you can just kind of see which hip hop artists you have the most diverse vocab in their lyrics. Um, on the other end of the spectrum is something that's less story driven and more just kind of exploratory. So this is more of like a tool that lets you look at population density across the world. Um, and this kind of 3D map. So instead of just doing a choropleth or something, uh, Matt used physical like extrusions in 3D to really get a sense of the density um, all across the world. And you can see how it like, changes over time and all this type of stuff. And then one last example is this one on pockets, again, using scrolly telling, uh, which looks at the disparity of pocket size uh, in both men's and women's genes. And Basically, it's not fair that <laughs> men have much uh, bigger pockets and they can fit a lot more things. And this kind of explains uh, how they went about their method and lets you kind of explore different items and which ones fit in how many different genes. And so this is a pretty interesting story done by Amory Thomas and Jan Deem. So that's kind of the pudding in a nutshell. Um, Most of our articles take about a month, um, <laughs> which is very, so it's funny you mentioned that short because coming from like the journalism world, that would be an eternity. You're lucky you get that much time to work on a project. Um, so actually like the MBA redraft story is one that I wanted to do. I was at the Boston Globe, but like it was too long. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't Mike's doing, but it was, yeah. So. Um, about four to six weeks, I'd say, for most, most stories. Um, and as Mike mentioned, uh, polygraph is still a thing. So basically... Um, I got a question around that. Um, oh, yeah. How do you go about um, choosing your, your stories that you're going to write? It's 
a great question. Um, it depends on the month. So we, we really experiment. So we're a small team. We're about six people uh, full time. And we've been, I guess, we've been, it's, this is two years. We've been in a publication for two full years now. And we have been experimenting with all sorts of different editorial processes. So that's why I say it depends on when you ask. So typically, it's each person comes to the team with their own pitch rather than the typical top down at journalism. It's like, you're going to work on this. It's less assignment based. So usually, it's someone's like, I've got this idea. They bring it to the team. The team gives them reactions. And there's almost no like full uh, control from anyone. It's just pretty flat. So. I won't be like, you can't do that. It's, it's usually, okay, this might not be my favorite thing, but just like go ahead and do it. And we haven't yet shut down a story. We, like, we haven't been like, no, you can't work on this. So um, we just check in pretty regularly. So we consider most of the stories we work on like passion projects because everyone is just bringing whatever they want to work on to the table. Um, so as my glue to polygraph, um, Polygraph was the former name, uh, what we published stuff on there, but now this is we've split into like two things. The Pudding is our editorial publication and Polygraph is our business entity. Um, so the way we make money is not on The Pudding. The Pudding is ad-free, no subscribers. Um, and Polygraph is our kind of client's arm. So we do work with uh, like Netflix, a lot of work with different uh, branches of Google and places like that and do the same kind of stuff, um, but just for them. So you, a lot of times it's kind of PR-based stuff. Sometimes it's in, internal things, but um, it's the same, same thing, but they're kind of two separate entities, um, if that makes sense. What is that process like? Which part of it? <laughs> like, uh, I don't know, like gathering their, what they want to even show, and like their requirements of it, and like what is that whole I'm sure you also tell them what works, what doesn't. Yeah, them. it really depends on the client and the project. So sometimes people are like, we want this thing to get picked up by the New York Times and we want it to be super flashy and they, that it's a much more prescriptive. And sometimes the better stuff is like, oh, we have this data set. Can you please just make something with it and we'll go with what you say. Um, so it re it's really all over the map. Um, but obviously the more enjoyable stuff is when it's less prescriptive and we get to really put on our creative hats. Um, and especially when like, if there's already something in mind that they want, but they haven't really explored the data, it can get a little, there's some tension there, right? When they hope it looks like this, but the data maybe just doesn't support that. So it becomes this kind of gray area. And so that's the, I think that's the, the biggest thing we, we have to deal with in terms of working with clients is how to make them happy but also like be true to what the data is actually showing what's the design process like with, with client projects yeah. uh depends on the client uh <laughs> but typically uh we try to work as much in public as possible so instead of just doing a bunch of stuff and then coming back with this big reveal at the end we like to just constantly be showing them exactly where we're at so even if it's a rough prototype just really kind of keeping them in the loop um, and from a design standpoint, uh, we usually will mock up very early on a few possibilities to really get a sense of what they're interested in. And we're really big fans of mood boards, like kind of giving them a whole bunch of things like, do you like the look and feel of this to really uh, get a sense of what they're looking for? Because sometimes they'll say one thing and then when they see something else, they'll kind of shift a little bit. So I think that's... We try, we try to cross that off as soon as possible. <laughs> do you do any exploration as to who would be, who is going to be viewing this in terms of like user? The audience? The, yeah, the audience, yeah. Um, not really. That's, that, that typically hasn't been part of our process. Um, with a lot of the stuff we've done, especially with like Google News Lab and, uh, and YouTube, really they're, they just want it to be everywhere, so they don't really have any specific person they're going after. A lot of the times, I mean, it'll be, we want press to pick this up, so we will kind of tailor it to stuff that we know will be more useful for like an outlet to write about. 
Um, so definitely like hitting on the press points and stuff is really important sometimes. You know, like what is the takeaway if I had to distill this? Or like what's that one chart that I can share, like an image form that will really describe the story. So sometimes I feel like actually um, press pickup is more of the focus for some of the client work we do. And how do you, how does the, um, what's your current thinking on how the pudding uh, contributes to or helps with or does it your client work in terms of like generating business? I can't say anything quantitatively, but um, I have to, I fully believe that Whenever we publish a good story on the pudding, it indirectly serves as marketing for Polygraph. Um, I'd say, I don't know, have an actual number, but like, you know, a, a couple stories a year we, we put out, they get some pretty good circulation. And then there's always like a bunch, a trickle of emails that are like, hey, we want to work with you. We saw this project. So sometimes they will specifically say where they came from and how they found us. Um, sometimes it's a little more ambiguous, but um, so far, we found that they seem to be. It seems to be a pretty symbiotic relationship. So cool. yeah, I mean, I knew that was part of it originally, at least, and I wasn't sure if that was still holding up. But yeah, it sounds like it is. It's definitely still the case now, and um, I mean, at least from a strategy standpoint, we haven't we haven't changed. Like the more we we feel, the more we can put out stories on the pudding, the better that represents Polygraph and gets Polygraph out there as well. And I think we've we've, we've <laughs> done a lot to try to distinguish the two because there's a lot of confusion early on, especially when things on the pudding actually had like polygraph logos and it was a very confusing. Um, but I think we've distanced ourselves a little bit where it's a little clear where you go for which thing. See, that's what it is. See, if you want to know what Experience Magazine is, it's the pudding. <laughs> there, so, you go. Uh, there you go. Plug. <laughs> <laughs> so this was uh, the most recent one I published which is what it sounds like. It's, it's a chart about the world through the eyes of the US. So basically, I really like this story because it actually was the first story I think I worked on here that wasn't actually my idea from the get-go. Um, this was actually piggybacking off of another project we recently published, which is right here by uh, Ilya and Jan, called The Brief History of the Past 100 Years. And so what Ilya did was he had this idea to look at New York Times headlines because they have this amazing archive where they have their headlines going back to like 1850 or something, maybe even further, 1850 probably. Um, and they have every single headline for every story that was ever published. So he wanted to do something that looked at those headlines. Um, and so his idea was to try to create this brief history to see what type of places or people were being mentioned, like what the most interesting keywords were, how did that change by decade. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then part of our editorial process is we have this thing called uh, story time where someone pitches their story and then the team goes around and gives reactions or like maybe like what ifs, like what if you did this or this um, to kind of give them some other ex uh, possible directions. And so my what if was, I was like, oh, what if we just looked at countries? Like that could kind of show us a little bit of how the U.S. is thinking about policy and how that changes over time. Um, and he liked the idea, and we decided he didn't want to incorporate it into this thing, so I was like, oh, I could just create a little companion story, um, and we can kind of work on it together since you're already working on the data. Um, so that's what we did, and I just kind of took it and ran with it, and I ended up going through a lot of different versions, and it ended up being this single chart that just shows uh, the flag of the most discussed country at the time um, for each month. Um, and so in this version, as you scroll, it just kind of highlights a row. There's some annotations to point out some significant moments. Uh, on the left-hand side, you have some example headlines from uh, the top couple years, or top couple months each year to get a sense of what is actually happening in the data. Um, and so I was really into this one, and then I also actually created a static image, which is pretty much the same thing, but a single image, and put it on uh, Reddit data is beautiful, and that actually blew up because Reddit loves images. And so it was just kind of, um, I guess, it confirmed that I had a, I thought I had an idea that people, other people would get excited about. Um, so that was really interesting for me, this story. Just I, was, I almost consider it like a gravy story. We're only going to publish one thing, and we ended up getting two things out of it. Um, so for me, 
it also just validated our process that we've just been kind of iterating on um, and showed that we can get other stories and get more content if you kind of like squeeze it a little bit. Um, and the biggest challenge on this was actually the parsing. So entity recognition on the country level, I thought it was just going to be really straightforward, but apparently it's a little more involved um, because there are the official ways that places are described, then there's more colloquial expressions, then there's like acronyms, right? So the US could be United States, it could be US. Um, there's the, I always pronounce this wrong, the demonym, so referring to like the people. So in Ireland, right, it's Irish. And so I went to kind of capture all that. Um, so I had to go through a few rounds and none of the entity recognition uh, libraries out there that I looked at, like Stanford, NER, there's a few things. They don't really capture the full breadth of possibility. Um, so I did a few rounds of like refining my, my scripts that would produce the results and then actually going in and manually spot checking as much as we could to be like, oh, we missed this or this is false, you know, false positives. Um, so like, uh, what was it? Uh, the country India, right? Like that could be confused with, if you say Indian, that could reference Native American Indian. So like it gets, a little, it gets very complicated. <laughs> uh, and I think it ended up being, so it says 740,000 section headlines. Um, I think we got it down to like 40,000 that matched on name. So it was quite laborious from a manual standpoint. But Wait, you looked at all 40,000? I initially was planning on it. We didn't quite get to it, but we, I, we basically we kept looking at it and then refining the script and got it to a place where it was like good enough. So this is definitely not perfect, but um, it's basically we kept refining it and the data stopped changing. So at that point, it was probably like close enough to like even if we got it perfect, it might not actually influence the end result. So right. um, was the searching constraint to like a one section front headline? This was also just, pay, uh, so not technically A1, it's all section fronts, so it wasn't just like the main front page. Um, I was actually going to do that, but uh, it turns out that it just weren't able to uh, classify as front page versus uh, section front in their data. Um, see the whole seat at the bottom? Oh yeah. What do you think happens? Well, oh, so this is everything not U.S. So this is the uh, this is uh, framing it from the U.S. perspective because okay. it's that makes more sense. <laughs> <laughs> How come there's that here that's all grayed out? Uh, yes. So no data, data issue. They're fixing it. I'm hoping they're the, I'll be able to update this. Um, there's a couple other gray spots where there just weren't enough results. Um, so I wasn't confident yeah, putting. Yeah, was the year they went on strike or whatever. Oh yeah, years. that was a crazy one. 1978 uh, or was it 78? Yes, I believe it was 78 for these three months. Uh, there was no paper printed. Yeah. Blew yeah. my mind. I was, yeah, like, I was like, oh, there's a problem with your data. Yeah. And, the, and the guy from the New York Times was like, oh, there was, there was a strike. I'm like, wow. <laughs> I learned something. What's, so, what's that time with the influx of Japanese? Yeah. This one down here? Down, yeah, a little more. Sorry. This is the 90s, I think. Um, Someone, I was reading all the Reddit comments, someone I think said this might have been when there was uh, an Olympics in Japan. Oh. But that also seems like a long period of time. But also it could just be, like, there could be plenty of reasons, right? There could just be a lot more business interest in some thing that happened with Japan at the time. Was I'm that, not a history buff, so. There was that period when people thought that Japan was going like, to surpass the US in terms of like, in the mid -90s. power and robots were around. So yeah, for the most part, what you see obviously are a lot of uh, international relations or uh, war. So obviously this is um, Iraq in the early 2000s dominated. Um, a lot more recently, super China heavy, which I think is just all much more economic driven. Um, but yeah, so I think this one was interesting because it was a really good cool. jumping off point for people that, like, that are interested in the various uh, phases of history to actually use this as a a launch board for a discussion. Um, so an individual is kind of tasked with both collecting that data and then building that visualization? Yeah, so I also didn't mention how we usually operate. It's, it's usually, uh, everyone on our team is kind of a jack of all trades, so everyone's able to do the, everything from the, the story to the writing to the data collection to the visualization and design. Um, we have started collaborating a little bit more over the past year or so, but um, 
for the most part, yeah, everyone does everything themselves, which is then a little more atypical from newsrooms, which are a little more siloed. Um, the thing that also was very interesting, that I, uh, which was a big discussion in, in the comments, was uh, more of a content standpoint, the use of modern flags versus the uh, flags at the, current, at the time we were talking about. So a lot of people actually wanted Germany in the early, whatever was it, early 1900s or the, no, sorry, the 1940s to have the, uh, you know, the, the, the swastika with the, the one that represented the, the flag of the time period. Um, and I saw a lot of good debate on that. We made the decision to go with the modern day flag because it's just much easier for you to, or us to identify what current country is referencing, even though the context has changed. Um, but those are always things that are very are revealing after you publish something. So you guys probably never thought about it while you were doing it? Or did you it crossed my mind, but it yeah. didn't, it, people made a much bigger deal of it after the fact. Yeah. Um, where to me it was, I was like, I don't know what half these older flags mean. So, and the whole point is to look at this and understand what it's referencing. So yeah. I completely. Yeah, obviously from a data standpoint, it's, yeah, you guys yeah. How did you disambiguate um, like Soviet Union news? Did that get lumped into Russia? Yes. Okay. So that was another one. So that was also part of the data processing. I had to, I had to rely on a few people that had a little more uh, insight into historical. So there, luckily, there's a great Wikipedia that has like the uh, flow of country names. So some countries have gone through like name changes, or they've split into multiple countries, or they've joined into a single country. So there was a lot of that involved in, in the data processing as well. Um, but yeah, like Soviet Union, it was is considered Russia in this in this database. Um, but yeah, so that was the most recent project I, I worked on, I suppose. I like that too. It's just like it's it's. I mean, it's um, it's like kind of it's one aspect, you know. What I mean, it's like one kind of pretty narrow thing, but it's also really telling and interesting, you know. And like, I feel like it's a little bit of a different direction for you guys to some degree. Like, I feel like you guys have generally had like things that had like we're making like multiple points, and I'm just kind of like making one. Is that is that new, or am I just not looking at enough of your stuff? Um. Yeah. So we definitely like self pigeonholed into we called it like the three chart story. Yeah. Um, and we've been trying to get away from that as much as possible, and not just get away from it because not that it doesn't work or anything, but you can tell a great story with a single chart or 30 charts or, or like I showed you with this one, this one was just one big scroll on interactive and this performed tremendously well. So I think we just want people to work on something that excites them rather than try to fit it into a specific format, especially because that's just more fun, right? Doing the same thing over and over is, can be a little uh, constricting. <laughs> yeah. Um, Do you have any design process around like cool. how you come up with your visualization, like stuff like the pocket size thing? You can't fit that into a standard graph or anything like that. Yeah. Um, we don't have any formal process. So, uh, like, it depends on who you ask. So my personal process is to get into prototyping and just start making something as soon as possible because my decision changes pretty quickly once I see stuff in action. So for that flag story, um, initially the chart was actually just going to be a spinny globe. Um, and I thought that was the best thing. Um, and then I actually put the data in. And I was like, oh, the globe is just staying there and not moving and it's really boring. So for me, prototyping and just constantly iterating is the best way for me to get like figure out what to do. Um, there are some people, so like Matt just jumps right into, we use Figma, um, he just jumps right into that and really just creates like high fidelity mockups because he already knows in his mind what he wants it to look like. Um, so it depends on, on the person, I think, and what, what works for them. Yes. Uh, usually, it's a, it's later. It's once we've actually kind of figured out what the narrative is, and like these are like get, get like a, a formal prototype working with all the content in there. Um, 
we do a weekly meeting, we call it our work in progress meeting, where all the whole team jumps in and someone it's someone's turn. They're like, this is what I'm working on. And depends on the stage it's at, but sometimes it's gonna be like, write everything down in this Google Doc and then we par- process it. Um, sometimes, depending on the subject matter, uh, we'll do a kind of hallway UX testing, but with just outsiders. So we'll just show it to random people or people that are deeply knowledgeable about a subject or totally new to it. So depending on what we're looking for, um, we'll kind of tailor the feedback to, to the story. You also have a Slack channel, which I question. We do. Are you talking about the Friends of the Pudding Slack? Yeah. So we do have a Patreon, and um, patrons get access to a Slack, and we try to post stuff early before we publish to that to give uh, like our community members a chance to, to give some feedback as well. So, but Do they have good feedback? They have the best feedback. Cool. <laughs> nice. So they're paying you to, uh, to, to, to do their user testing, to do user testing for you. <laughs> no, it's, it's called a sneak. It's called a sneak peek, Mike. <laughs> okay. Right. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, I can show you the boy band database because you shouted about it, but. Uh, <laughs> so this one's interesting. Um, this this I guess totally goes against the three chart story. Will we have audio? I don't know. Um, oh, it's coming from my computer. Anyways, this one is pretty simple. It's a tour of every boy band to chart the top 100 since 1980. Um, and this is pretty much it. It's just an, uh, this kind of musical experience of dancing boy band members. Uh, very nostalgic if you grew up in, <laughs> during any of these time periods. Um, so I guess this one is interesting. I'll turn the music off. <laughs> no, that's the best part. Uh, this one was interesting because uh, the da- so the data processing for this, we actually relied on, um, I guess, people in our community to help chip in with the collection process. So um, if you actually look at the music video for this, this is exactly how everyone is dressed. So th- uh, we actually got all their styles like to a T uh, and so we crowdsourced uh, I think we have about 30 or 40 people watch a video and then fill out a form based on what everybody was wearing and all that stuff um, and then kind of recompiled it um, and got this database so which was kind of cool so new kids on the block dance moves too? Like, what are the-, the dance moves are all are all made up That's great. Um, which was also a new experience for us. So this was, um, we actually worked with an illustrator, uh, Malik, who um, did all the animations in uh, After Effects and then exported them using, I think it's called Body Movin', and we use a library by Airbnb called Lottie, which lets you, it basically turns it into frame-by-frame animations. So we could control the, basically the After Effects dance moves in JavaScript. So this is all, there's like, a dozen or two do- uh, or so moves, and we would just programmatically kind of change them up. And we had like slow dance versus, so these are all the slow dance moves. Oh my god. <laughs> and so what we did, which was, which was kind of cool, um, in After Effects, Malik drew every single permutation of, you know, shirt style, hairstyle, and all of that. And then in the JavaScript, we have, right, the data for each, each band member and would change it. So there's only like six. Uh, characters on here, and so we're just changing in JavaScript um, and doing all the dance news dynamically. So it was actually really interesting from a technical standpoint, especially because this is not like the how most people use Lottie. They will use it for like some logo animation or something. Um, how did you figure out to do it that way? Was it just like happenstance because he made it in After Effects? And like, oh, we, didn't like we we went in reverse. We're like we want them to dance, but we also want them to change. And then we're like, well, what? tech is available out there that can help us do this and we found Lottie and we're like this, and we did a couple experiments to see if it could if you could like change it and then so like all this all the coloring um, is totally done with it's just all CSS um, so yeah it was it was definitely a really interesting technical experiment and then I think I'm I'm inappropriately using Google Analytics as a uh, faux database to store the you can rate um, a band uh, if you like the band or not. Um, so it, that's actually those those numbers are coming from Google Analytics. So that's like a, a tracking event, and then I have a script. Actually, I think it's just with um, Google spreadsheets. You can 
have it spit out um, stuff into a Google spreadsheet, and then I'm with a cron job turning that into a JSON file. So now we know that 86% of people have voted that they like this band. Um, so that was another interesting experiment. It's working. I think it goes against their terms of service, but um, it was a small scale experiment. Uh, <laughs> Do you have a specific band you'd like to see? Uh, Bastard Boys slash yeah. NSYNC slash oh, any cool. band in that. Bastard Boys still be right here. Oh my god, I'm so excited. Oh wow, <laughs> this is so funny. Do you have like, sound off that like, one? Like, super long and like a meeting. I love it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So this was fun. So this is a good example of a story that I thought would have been really popular that just hasn't taken off yet. Um, I, uh, maybe I was just too excited about it, um, <laughs> but it was a good lesson in that. But on the flip side, it has, I believe it's the second highest from like a time on page thing we've put out this year. So that's always, that means people are probably actually sitting through this and watching it, which is cool. Um, how do you think about that when you're thinking about creating something of like how, how long it will do on the internet? Like, is that a consideration? Um, we don't. So we, we've, we're trying to get away from, from that. I mean, it's obviously always great to see stuff that people enjoy that gets like circulated. Um, but we really don't have any, we don't have any reason or like there's no business or financial motivation to have something on the pudding spread or get a lot of attention. It's more just like a personal pride thing. Um, so we don't have any sort of goals or metrics around if it gets shared a lot, what the page views are like. It, it's really just a personal satisfaction thing. I mean, my personal preference is that people spend a long time on, on the story, so I just happen to value like uh, time on page as a good metric. Um, but again, it depends on the chart. Like, right, the map, the map thing, it's a single chart, so I wouldn't expect people to spend as much time as like something where you can go through 90 boy bands. Um, Anyways. The coolest thing is like the coordination of the clothing, because it really <laughs> simplifies it, so it kind of shows how they're all way more mashy than I thought. <laughs> oh, there's in sync for you. Yeah. Like, like, Featuring the Joey Fatone. Like, find the pattern, everybody has like some unique element, but they're all... Yep. That's, that's great. <laughs> so anyways. Uh, th yeah, that was the boy band project. Should we keep going? Or do we pick it? you talked about that, Russell. <laughs> I guess. So, so what kind of technologies are you using for a lot of these? Does everyone have the same skill sets or is everyone on your team? On the team? Yeah. Um, we definitely all have the same skill sets. Um, there's definitely strengths in certain people than others. Um, so Matt's gotten really good at doing anything with maps and specifically Mapbox and lately. Um, if I want some more statistical or heavy uh, data analysis stuff, like I'll go to Amber because she, she's really great at R. Um, so I think for the most part it's pretty dispersed, but there's a few, I guess, expertises that have developed. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's pretty even. Do you have a pudding slush? A pudding slush? Oh, 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 yeah, we do have a build system. Um, we call it our starter template. Where is it? So we use kind of like every, every newsroom has their own little kit for creating stories, so you don't have to, you know, reinvent the wheel each time. We use uh, Gulp as our, our, task, our task runner. Um, and it kind of has all the all the goodies. So you know, ES6 translation. We use stylus and handlebars. And my favorite thing, which is something we did at the Globe um, very early on, was using Google Docs as a poor man CMS. So there's a nice little library called Archie that lets you just convert uh, Google Docs um, and like using key value pairs to a JSON file. So then you can pipe that into your HTML, which was like the biggest revelation for working with writers at the Boston Globe. Having them not have to like email us copy updates when we created an interactive was amazing. Um, and then yeah, all the other kind of typical, typical stuff. Um, yeah, it's our starter template.
Um, yeah, I don't know. Do we do we want to see another story? Sure. We only went through two, I suppose. We can we can go a little deeper if there's any others that are. Do an NBA story, Russell. Uh, <laughs> those aren't those aren't the most interesting ones though. The alley one, one. How do you prioritize work for the pudding and for the uh, uh, polygraph? In terms of like what we work on next, like what's our cue? Yeah, like yeah. Do you do both at the same time or? Um. Same oh time. yeah. Oh yeah. So there is maybe there's one person on our team that's client like first like that's why we we brought them on was to handle a um a, a client that's we always have constant work for um but for the most part everyone's kind of 50 50. um our client work really ebbs and flows like sometimes we'll have three projects at once for like a couple months and then we'll have a month where we don't have a project um, but for the most part i'd say like across the board we're about 50 50 so like half our day or week is on client stuff half our day is on on pudding stuff um, I prefer to, to work on the, the pudding editorial stuff just because, you know, you get full control, and, <laughs> which is nice. Um, but, and, I mean, in terms of priority, client work always is priority because, again, we don't have any sort of um, expectation in terms of how much we, we publish on, on the pudding. Um, it's, we try to publish something about once a week if we can. Um, but again, there's, there's no, there's no one holding us accountable except for ourselves if we don't. So naturally client work will, will bubble up to the top from a priority standpoint. Who has the largest vocabulary? Uh, Aesop Rock. Yeah. <laughs> Even though I think he just updated it and I think bus driver, I don't know who that is. Aesop Rock and then bus driver. And then, which every, everybody loves, the Wu-Tang button. Everybody in Wu-Tang has <laughs> great vocab. <laughs> I can do one more story, I suppose. Um, not an NBA story. Let's see. What about life after uh, death? Ooh, OK, that one's a good one to talk about. So technically, you can go on our YouTube channel and watch me code this from start to finish, the entire process. Um, for some reason, I decided to to do, we, we got into doing some YouTube streaming of like behind the scenes stuff for uh, our patrons this past summer. Um, and so I just wanted to like record the whole process. So everything from like the data collection to the prototyping to the design, oh, that's all in there. Um, so this one, I guess I'll show the story first. Um, but basically the premise is looking at page views uh, on Wikipedia after someone passes away, specifically celebrities. Um, and so it starts with some scrolly telling um, by putting just page views in context by uh, Beyonce and looking at a spike in Beyonce's traffic, which was when she released Lemonade. So it just kind of grounds the whole thing and like, okay, this like page views change when something happens. Um, and then it puts it in perspective by introducing uh, Prince. Uh, he actually ended up dying around the same time. and it rescales it and shows you just how much greater uh, the page views effect was when Prince passed away versus Lemonade, which is now just almost looks normalized. Um, so that kind of introduces the topic of how significant it is. And then it, this is the, the data set um, of the day or the 48 hours of all the people after they passed away. Um, so you can, if you're not familiar with them, you can, oh wait, then I put it in some more context, a lot of scrolling telling here. Um, so this was the Trump inauguration, LeBron James and the NBA Finals, the Royal Wedding, so other historical events, and then you can kind of get a little bit of a view of every, every person um, if you're interested. And then the rest of the story just kind of goes and looks at it from a couple different angles, asks a few different questions. Um, so this is looking at, this is just a table of the biggest increase, right? So like Prince already was getting a lot of page views, but there's some people, right, that left even higher, um, which means they weren't getting, like Kate Spade wasn't getting a lot of page views and then her, her death got a lot of attention. Um, so this is just a full, a full table of that. And there's a little omnipresent filter feature. So if you're just interested in like musicians, uh, it'll filter just musicians. Um, which also affects all the rest of the graphics on the page. 
which is something I was trying. I don't know if that was a good thing or not. Um, and then this kind of histogram E chart looks at how long until they return to normal traffic because everyone hit this huge spike um, and then kind of come back down pretty quickly. So the more interesting ones I figured are the people where they went up and then it took a while for them to return to normal page views. It just showed like which people like kind of stayed uh, in the spotlight, so to speak. Um, so that's what that chart is. And then the last one is uh, looking at just the net increase in page views. So who sort of got this weird celebrity bump after that, or you know, it got more recognition after they died or became more vaulted. So uh, Dolores O'Riordan from the Cranberries, right? Um, her page views just kind of stayed sustained after, after the fact for a couple months and are still up. Uh, and so that's what this last uh, chart is looking at. And that was that one in a nutshell. I think the story is interesting to me uh, because the only reason we decided to work on this in the first place is because Wikipedia reached out to us because they were like, oh, we have this um, page that we like want to showcase uh, uh, work that people have done. And we've done a story in the past using Wikipedia data. Um, and I found the Wikipedia page views tool. Let's see if it's still up here. Wikipedia. Um, they have this awesome tool. So I was like, it's, let's see if there's anything I can do with Wikipedia data and make a story out of it. So it was really backwards to our normal approach, which is starting with a question that we have like this burning desire to know what the answer is and find data to support it. This was, let's look at data and see if we can find an interesting insider question. Um, so this was a really cool tool. You can actually look at like what the top page views every day are, every month. Um, and so the reason I ended up finding, coming up with this angle is because I looked at this and looked at a couple days and I was like, I kept seeing people that had died. I was like, that's kind of interesting in and of itself. And so I kind of went down that, that rabbit hole. Um, and that's how that story came about. Cool. That is all. Where, where do you find inspiration for your visuals? Ooh. Like that chart towards the end that had, you know, like the spikes, and I'm not sure how to describe it. Uh, it's, it's in. It's in. It's uh. It's miscorrectly called the joy plot, um, <laughs> because of what was the joy division. Um, there it had an album cover oh, that yeah. had something like that. It's I'm blanking on what the actual term is. Uh, um, going yeah, back. That, that oh yeah. So this actually was specifically uh, a fad for a couple a couple weeks or months on, on Reddit data is beautiful. Uh, a few people made charts in this fashion. I feel like that happens a lot on if you ever go on Reddit data is beautiful. Um, like certain charts will kind of become in favor and then everyone will produce them. Uh, so I just had been wanting to create a chart in this style a while and had this data kind of worked for it. Um, so typically, it's really just kind of seeing what everyone else is doing in the community. Um, I'm a big fan of everything that like Washington Post and New York Times interactive teams do. Uh, and yeah, just try to consume as much data vis as, as possible. Like flowing data, there's all sorts of great publications. And like Andy Kirk's visualizing data, he puts like a, a recap every, every month of all the best stuff. So that's where most of it comes from. Yeah. How do you communicate the actual scrolling tellingness of a story without actually building it to show it? You know what I mean? Like with your team, like how, are you, how do you talk about it? Like now this is going to come flying yeah. from here to the left. Or like <laughs> Luckily, internally, everyone gets it at this point, so we can use our imaginations. It's all, uh, when we storyboard something like that, um, it's usually like you just have to think of them as individual snapshots of charts. Um, and the real reason we always do the scrolling telling, besides like forcing people to see the thing rather than interact with it, is the object constancy, right? So like the reason it's useful here is not just because we can make a cool transition, but you can really get a, a good sense of how the scale changes <laughs> once this one comes in. So it's like, oh yeah, that one's huge, and like now it's tiny. And so I think the object constancy is really the big reason for me why you ever want to do scrolling telling. Um, rather than just you can scroll and something can change. Yeah. Um, 
but in terms of commuting it to people, usually you just have to do it like, this is the slide, this is the slide, and trust will be like a transition between the two. So it's harder to communicate visually. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Russell. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs>